This presentation will cover the basics of trauma team activation as it is practiced at Regents Hospital. I'd like to provide an overview of the process itself, including the various trauma activation criteria that we use. I'll talk about the management of the resuscitation team, and this is from the standpoint of the team leader. And then finally, I'll talk about some general management issues that do pop up on a fairly regular basis during trauma team activations. I always like to start with a what is wrong in this picture picture and obviously it was very important to get that can of gasoline restrained not so much the toddler in the passenger side. So why do we have a resuscitation team? There are several things at play here. First of all obviously it's for the patient and it does provide very rapid comprehensive and hopefully thorough patient care. It also utilizes a multidisciplinary approach since we have emergency medicine physicians, surgeons, and trainees for both of those disciplines who are involved in the process. It's also an educational process and that's why we choose to uh, do as many as we do, about 800 per year, and it does provide good education on the basics of resuscitation and a lot of the topics that come up during trauma team activations. This applies not only to physicians and residents, but the nurses and some of the technologists and technicians who work with us. Finally, it is good for departmental relationships. Since it does involve multiple disciplines and it is a small room, we have to work with each other, we get to know each other pretty well. So first, let's talk about the preparation process. And this can be broken into several components. First of all, there's the page. And this may be a pager type page, or it may be an overhead if you live in the emergency department. The next step is to assess the personnel that is available to you, preparing that team, and then finally getting the area around you, which is basically the trauma team, I'm sorry, the uh, trauma bay ready for the resuscitation. So let's look at the page. It basically is a collection of patient information. It contains things like time to arrival. Now, there are certain vagaries about this. First of all, the um, Regions Direct is not to call a trauma team activation with anything more than about 10 minutes because the rule is that if you receive a page, you must immediately proceed to the emergency department. These estimates are ne not necessarily reliable and traffic may be slow, traffic may be faster than expected, and so the patient may be there sooner than you expect. So we want people there right away, but we also don't want to see things like patient will arrive in 45 minutes because nobody has time to go down and hang around for 45 minutes. It will give an indication of the patient age. This is important because if it is less than 16, they are automatically a pediatric patient and things change a little bit. It will attempt to describe some of the mechanism of injury and some potential scene data, scene vital signs, uh, if they are available. Now, if it hasn't already been done, trauma team activation criteria can be applied at this point to figure out, is this actually supposed to be a trauma team activation? And in some cases, if it is going to be a TTA, some pre-notification of key people might be in order. A trauma surgeon, especially if it is something that looks like might require rapid operation just to make sure that they're not doing a case where they might be delayed in getting down to the emergency department. Occasionally there is the temptation to call other specialists. Probably one of the most common ones would be OB. This is generally a bad idea uh, because these specialists really don't know what to do in the resuscitation room and they tend to get in our way and our job is to save the patient's life first before we get them into the room so they can try to figure out things that are pertinent to their own discipline. So let me go over the trauma team activation criteria. We do not have a lot. Uh, we have a group of physiologic criteria, no vital signs, can't breathe, hypotensive, hypothermic, or impaired from a brain standpoint. Then we have some anatomic things, flail chest, depressed skull fracture, focal neurologic deficits, an abdominal exam that is remarkable and may represent severe injury, vascular injury, multiple long bone fractures or amputations. 
the only mechanism criteria that we have have to do with penetrating injuries. We do not use things like fall from a height, intrusion into a car, death at the scene, things like that. It's mainly penetrations to the face, head, or the rest of the torso. Finally, physicians can use their judgment and saying, geez, even though none of these criteria are met, I believe that this patient would benefit from the speed and thoroughness of the trauma team. And we extend that same courtesy to our EMS colleagues so that they can potentially call these for us in the field. Now, let's talk about the pagers. First of all, for people who live outside of the emergency department, they will be carrying a pager and each of the positions on the team will have a person that owns a pager. Sometimes those people are in the emergency department, they'll get an overhead page so they will know when to report. If you have a pager, whoever holds that pager must go to the trauma team activation immediately. This is significant to surgical residents who may be in the operating room doing a case because if they are going to be doing an operative case then they need to hand that pager off to somebody with a reasonable skill set at the same level. Now I talked about the estimated time and the fact that if it is a pediatric trauma activation less than 16 years of age the pediatric intensivists who stay in-house 24-7 will show up at the resuscitation as well. Now, let's assess the personnel. That's the next thing that needs to be done. And these things are done by primarily the team leaders. So first of all, you need to look at physician staffing and experience. Is the surgeon available? Are they stuck in an OR case? Will they need to call in their backup? Do the emergency medicine physicians have other med stave cases going on that may thin out their ranks? If so, what are the available resources? Are there EM physicians from other pods that can come in? Are there other surgeons in the house that can come down? Where are they going to come from? How many do you need? And what experience levels? This is something where flexibility and creativity is needed so you can get the right people down there. This is particularly pertinent in cases where there are multiple casualties. You may run into the same issues with nursing staffing and the charge nurse in the ED will help with this. Uh, they are part of the team, although they hang out outside of the room. There is a specific trauma nurse group that are the only ones that participate in these, and uh, they are available around the clock, and they are quite aware of other available resources, uh, other nurses who may be working in other parts of the emergency department. So next, let's prepare the team. First of all, everybody needs to sign in. They need to get dressed. It is very important to have your universal precautions or personal protective gear on before you even go into the room. Everybody should have their name tags on so we know who they are despite the fact that their face is covered. Team leader needs to identify themselves and ideally will brief the team, giving them just the basic information about what needs to happen. If there's some kind of pre-notification that's needed, for example, CT scan to make sure they're available, specific specialists that may be required during the resuscitation, or the operating room, uh, especially if it's uh, expected to be a very rapid transit to the OR, the charge nurse needs to know. Normally, the trauma staff will take care of this function, but if multiple people think of it, that's ideal. It uh, leaves less opportunity for it to get forgotten. And finally, what the team leader should do is review the tasks that will be necessary in this resuscitation based on the information available on the patient. Typically, it will follow our usual sequence, but every once in a while, you will have, say, a proximal amputation, and it may require us to check bleeding, cover the area up, wrap it before the rest of the resuscitation proceeds. Now, let's prepare the area, and I just separate this into lights, camera, and action because it's easy to remember. The lights include the french fry lights, which are our warmers, and then fluid warmers, such as the ranger system, that, that may be needed, and these should be used any time that blood is going to be given or if we know the patient is hypothermic. We do have a video camera that uh, does function, and the scribe should turn that on so that it is possible to review that at a later time. And then finally, action. Once again, make sure everybody has their universal precautions. If we entertain that there might be an intubation, then make sure that all of the appropriate instrumentation is available. 
If chest procedures such as chest tube or thoracotomy are required, once again, get those things out. And then finally, medications will probably be necessary either for intubation or for control of pain and uh, sedation management. Now, the resuscitation itself can be broken down into four steps. First of all, there are the major tasks, the major decisions that need to be made. One key thing is, does the patient need to be in the operating room? That needs to be decided quickly. And then finally, the overall evaluation and treatment algorithm based on the injuries found in this patient. So, first of all, let's, let's do this. We'll look at the map. We'll see where people stand. We'll talk about what we do next, which is identify immediately life-threatening injuries and treat them immediately. Once those are taken care of, then we can look at other life-threatening injuries that may take a little bit longer, treat them as soon as practical, figure out whether this patient needs to be in the operating room, and if so, make sure that the operating room is aware of this. And then finally, the last thing, once we've cataloged everything during our physical examination, is identify all injuries and develop a treatment plan for each of them. Now here's the map. The dirty dozen, I call it. Now, there are two faculty members, one at the head, one at the foot. Typically, the head will be emergency medicine, the foot will be um, surgery. Now, these may switch off at various times, and I will get into that shortly. The airway physician is at the head. This will typically be an emergency medicine resident. There will be two residents at mid-levels on either side of the patient. A team leader who may be a chief uh, surgical resident or a, uh, an emergency medicine resident. Two nurses, one on either side. A scribe down at the foot of the bed. Respiratory therapist at the top left corner of the patient. And then finally, some people who are kind of hanging out outside the room. You may have a helper or ER tech who can pop in if needed for any tasks, and a charge nurse who is a liaison between what's going on inside the room and what's happening outside of it. Who's on the team? Now, this is a little bit confusing, and this is due to the fact that we do have two sets of trainees, and due to staffing patterns, we've come up with a specific 12-hour pattern. So. The cutoff times are 7 o'clock, so from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., the daylight hours, the team leader is the surgical chief resident, the faculty is the trauma surgeon with a backup as the emergency medicine faculty, the MD1, who is actually doing the ATLS protocol on the patient's right side, is a mid-level emergency medicine resident, and the uh, resident on the patient's lower left side is a uh, usually a PG-1 surgeon. Nighttime, we flip-flop some of these roles. So from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., the team leader is the emergency medicine chief. The MD-1 is the um, junior level surgical resident. MD-2 is still the PGY-1 surgeon. And faculty, the primary faculty is the emergency medicine staff with a surgeon as the backup. Pete's intensivist will show up for any patient less than 16. A couple of confusing things. First of all, the trade-off. Let's say that it's daytime and the surgery chief is a little bit delayed, so the emergency medicine chief steps in and takes over that role. What happens when the surgical chief gets there? It depends on how long the resuscitation has been going on, how complicated it is, and whether it makes sense to transfer all that information to the other person versus just let the emergency medicine resident finish. The other confusing thing is um, the patient is going to leave the intent, uh, sorry, leave the emergency department, and an H and P is going to be done typically by one of the surgical residents. But it is very important that information that was gleaned on physical examination during the TTA get passed on to that resident before they leave the ED. If for any reason a lot of information on the physical exam has been generated but is not passed over, we will request that the emergency medicine resident who uh, gathered that information travel with us until that information can be put down into EPIC. Major decisions that the team leader has to think about. First of all, will this patient be admitted? And for the most part, if you are a trauma team activation patient, the answer should be yes. There are rare exceptions, typically stabbed to the chest, which doesn't get through the sub tissue, which may fake us out. But in general, the answer to that question will almost always be yes. 
Do they need to be in the operating room? That may take a little while to decide, uh, but again, that has some impact on OR flow, and it's important that the OR charge nurse be informed of the likelihood as quickly as possible. Where will the patient go next? Will they go to CT scan? Will they go to imaging? Um, will they go to angiography? And then finally, where will they end up? Do they need to go to the intensive care unit? Will they end up in the ward? Will they end up in the morgue? So does the patient need to be in the operating room? Well, first of all, some of them are obvious. The patient is eviscerated if they have a major vascular injury, uh, if they have a, an amputation, partial or complete, they're going to be there sooner rather than later. Sometimes it's not quite so obvious. You'll have a patient who doesn't meet any of those criteria. They're not hypotensive, but they have increased fluid requirements, which should tip you off to the fact that they are losing blood. Or maybe they have some very mild, hype, um, very mild pressure dips, not hard crashes below 80, but um, just some, some dips that are of concern. Again, those are patients that, that may have bleeding that may require them to go to the operating room and the source needs to be identified quickly. One cardinal rule, no hypotensive trauma patient can travel anywhere except to the operating room. They cannot go to CT scan. They certainly cannot go to angiography or MRI. Hypotension keeps you in the resuscitation room until we figure out what body cavity is um, being bled into and they need to be then sent to the operating room. Now there are some patients where things are going along well and then you get the frightening news that the blood pressure just dropped to 80. Sometimes people will try to say well this is a, it's a cuff malfunction. The team leader has 90 seconds from that point to figure out is it real or is it mechanical malfunction. FAST is extremely helpful in sorting that out. If the FAST is um, not confirmatory, then diagnostic peritoneal lavage can be used, although this is done extremely rarely these days. Just a few words about the evaluation and treatment algorithms. For major blunt trauma, the resuscitation room mindset should be, let's get to CT as soon as possible. So you need to make sure that there are no life-threatening problems, make sure that the patient's uh, vital signs are good and then get them to CT scan because that's where most of the diagnostics will take place and then once that's complete get to the next area as soon as practical wherever that happens to be until they get to their final resting place. So complete examination, complete evaluation, where do you do that? Pretty much in the emergency department. Full exam, any tubes that are necessary, basic x-rays can be done in the resuscitation room, but more sophisticated, higher quality ones need to be done in the radiology department. For penetrating trauma, if it's to the head, that means it's typically a gunshot, they need to get to CT as quickly as possible so we can see their salvageability. If they have a gunshot to the chest, then we have to prove that they have to go to the operating room because many patients with uh, penetrating trauma to the chest do not. They may have a pneumothorax, they may have a hemothorax, but injury to the heart and great vessels is thankfully not very common. Tables are turned in the abdomen. If there's a penetrating injury to the abdomen, then you have to prove that they don't need to go to the operating room. And much of their evaluation may end up taking place in that area. Every trauma patient is different. There is no cookbook approach. We have various guidelines that we use places where people stand, things that people do, but nothing is etched in stone. And it is okay to vary from these routines, but if you choose to do that, make sure that you have a well thought out reason for it. Make sure that you have considered what the consequences to the patient will be. And then finally, be willing to discuss that at a video review conference or receive a performance improvement letter from the trauma program asking for your explanation. That's why it's so important to think about your reasons uh, so that because you can pretty much assume you will be called out on it within a few days. Patient flow is generally a one-way street. Our average resuscitation time in the ED is 16 minutes and then we leave, hopefully never to come back. However, occasionally the, the patient room may not be ready, so they do have to come back briefly while that occurs. Sometimes a procedure is required 
and this may be a laceration repair, insertion of a traction pin, things like that, although we are trying to reduce this as much as possible. And we want to make this only a brief stay. We do not want patients who are major trauma victims in the emergency department for extended periods. If you have any questions regarding all of this, please feel free to talk to your faculty or uh, contact me, uh, Dr. McGonigal, and I would be happy to answer your questions. And I'll give contact information here in the next few slides. This is just a nice little segue into additional information that is available for you. Specifically, this is the Trauma Professionals blog. This is published every weekday at 9 a.m. It's available at regionstraumapro.com, as you see on the bottom. And these are typically four, five, six paragraphs of relevant, interesting, and hopefully helpful information that come out every day. They are typically on problems or questions that come up on a daily basis. Here are ways that you can contact me if you want further information. Thank you very much.